Yeah, to end in beauty. I like cynical people in a way. I'm very glad, uh, well, to give a complete detailed summary of what happened today. That was my task. So I will repeat everything that has been said in five points. And they will follow each other chronologically. One, two, three, four, and five. After all, many of you are scientists. Five points, then you know also very well when things will be finished, a moment of happiness for all of you. The best moment of my talks most of the time. And let's start with the first point. What's the most important element? Individualism, being a brilliant individual, or the power of the group? Both elements were present here tonight. And then I let myself inspire by my um, favorite philosopher, Walter de Brouwer. <laughs> brilliant guy. You don't see it at first glance, but he can be brilliant in his better moments. And he says, <laughs> being brilliant is politically incorrect in Europe. So let's be brilliant then, and let's be also individuals. Because a group cannot live without the brilliancy of individuals. We have to start from that. And I think that individuals, after all, are not bad. As long as they are a little bit brilliant, I mean, we don't have to exaggerate. Uh, after all, everybody has his dark, mom dark moments. And individuals who are slightly brilliant will never be egoists. There is a difference between individualism, people who are thinking themselves, and egoism, people who are just thinking for themselves and about themselves. That's different. So let's just try to be a little bit brilliant between 9 and 5 in the afternoon. Let's do that. I think it's not a bad idea. After all, another thing is, of course, here are too many brilliant people and that's a problem. They should spread, because if everybody in a room is brilliant, nobody is brilliant anymore. So we have to democratize our brilliancy and to meet with other people who are less brilliant than we are and who will recognize immediately our genius. Here it's a bit too difficult <laughs> with all the stars present here today. <clears throat> Let's go to the second point. The second point is we have to live attentively. Because is it really true, and here I'm of course on a slippery road, is it really true that this is an important period of transformation? That everything is changing quickly, faster than before. Is that really true? Is this a turning point in history? Politicians always talk about that, and other people who are a little bit less educated. They always say, this is a turning point in history. And then I wonder, well, lucky me, lucky me. We are living those turning points. Our fathers, grandfathers, they didn't experience anything. A, a few world wars, the Holocaust, but nothing important. <laughs> we are the people of the turning point. But are we really? Are we really? Sometimes I think we have to situate the turning point in a swimming pool. You just enter the pool, not without fear. Then you swim for 25 meters. Then there is a turning point. <laughs> you just take it. 25 meters again, a new turning point. And after two turning points, we are exactly where we started. Maybe we should really pay attention, and I mean, we should be like, well, people, sometimes we are like people on a boat, and we are discussing about life, about technology, about human existence, and even, after a few beers, about love. And we think the world is stable, we look in each other's eyes, nothing changes, the beauty and the comfort of the boat. And then, when we look outside, we see that the landscape changed in the meantime. We are not in the hilly mountains anymore. We are close to the seaside. And we didn't know. We didn't look. And maybe we should be aware also of small changes. They are very often tremendously important. And they influence us maybe more than all the big concepts. 
I'm in favor of the big concepts, but I also do like the small changes. And history will tell us whether things are changing quickly or not today. Maybe we are just um, telling jokes among ourselves, but good jokes and by brilliant people. That's a consolation. <laughs> and let's go to the third point. What I do like here in this place is that everybody is talking about the future. So nobody was wrong today. Everybody told the truth. We can't control anything. And some went to a remote past, some billion years, we will be much older than when we discuss the topic again. Others went only until 2040. And of course, then things may become more debatable. The nice thing about the future is I also like talking about it. Nobody can control it. You're always right. And you have a vision when you talk about the future. When you talk about the past, well, that's of course well, less positive, because the past, uh, you can make mistakes, of course, about facts, and also about the interpretation of facts, even in our personal lives. Think a moment. Sometimes we imagine that, that we are good friends with others, because we are professionally speaking colleagues, and after the end of the professional relationship, we don't see each other anymore without pain. Maybe we are less attractive than we think we are. And sometimes we meet people who crossed our path in a remote past when we were children, and they tell us stories that move us deeply. Even our own past is difficult, is hard to interpret decently for us. So let's go for the future, the elusiveness and the truth of the moment. I like that, but I have also my questions. Talking about the, 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 the future is refreshing, but at the same time hazardous. I like it because we can't be wrong. And that's beautiful. Then the fourth element. When I was listening to people here, I admired them all, also professionally speaking. As a politician, it's my duty to admire everybody. <laughs> I always have to say, wow, you're brilliant, you're beautiful. And most of the time it's true, especially since Politicians don't look very well anymore to, to what they see before them. But I was also thinking, how self-confident should we be? I like self-confidence, although I also like shyness. It's very moving. I like self-confidence, but when does it become vanity? That's the question. When are we going too far? I think that's the main difference between, in a way, men and women. That's why women are superior to men, and now I'm joining a topic that Mark Lux already developed. He likes women a lot. He had to wait for a long time as a Catholic priest. <laughs> but why are women superior to men? So let's not, well, discuss the, the content of that statement. It's correct, so no arguments needed anymore. But why is it? Because women are more intelligent than men are? Yeah, to, okay. okay, to some extent. But when we use a, a large notion of, of uh, human intelligence, even some men do qualify. Huh? Let's admit that. But the true difference, the true difference between men and women is vanity. Men are vain, women are not. Of course, women are open for compliments, that's true. Huh? And when men, uh, in a naive mood, or even sincerely, that can happen, give them compliments, <laughs> then, then women do enjoy that, absolutely. With the twinkling eyes and other signs of uh, external beauty. And it's real, it's true. But while they are enjoying the compliments, you see them thinking, how can I use this? What can I do with that? And that's very intelligent in a way. It's multitasking. Huh? <laughs> you can enjoy and count at the same moment. Men, when you give them a compliment, they think it is sincere. <laughs> and that's the difference. So we miss the dynamism, the open mind, the flexibility to be truly brilliant. We are naive because we are vain. Vanity kills 
creativity. And so I come to my very last point, and that deals with what I have truly experienced here, the quality of the noble art of conversation. We have been talking about a lot of topics which are rather elusive, without a fixed answer, with many question marks remaining. And that's something I truly like. And that's what I miss sometimes in our current society. People don't like discussing anymore. We want to talk about technical issues that have a solution. They distrust ideologies because, well, they led to many disasters during the 20th century. And that's why they don't want to argue about questions without a clear answer. You find the same thing in the Latin maxim, a horrible maxim, and, uh, well, Latin will become the official language of dependent Flanders very soon, but the, <laughs> but the maxim remains horrible. It's de gustibus, de mulieribus, et de coloribus non est disputandum. About taste, women, and colors, you don't discuss. Yeah, but what should be the topic of the discussions then? <laughs> Is there anything else worthwhile discussing? It are those rather elusive topics where personal taste plays a part, but when argumentation is also important, that are the focus of everybody's life. And what I did enjoy here during this meeting is that very scientific topics were dealt with with some emotional flavor. And at the same time, some emotional topics were dealt with with scientific flavor. And I like that interaction. And so we come to the solution of the question of today. Who is going to save the world? Well, the question should rather be, politicians always change the question, what is going to save the world? And I think it is a kind of profound lightness that I found in this meeting. It was light, short, but at the same time profound, deep. And that will be, I think, the style, the methodology of the future profound lightness. In the past, we had very often, and we still have, empty seriousness. <laughs> it's not working anymore. We go for profound lightness. <laughs>